Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the special broadcast and intimate conversation continued with Dr. Marilyn Kingston and Sylvia Foti. Let me bring them to the floor. Here you are. So uh, we had a conversation last weekend um, with Dr. Kingston and uh, Sylvia Foti about uh, being descendants of Studhoff prisoners. We'd like to continue the conversation today. Uh, Dr. Kingston and Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us or for inviting me. I shouldn't speak for Sylvia. Go ahead and speak for me, Marilyn. It's fine. Thank you. So here we go. For those of you who didn't have an opportunity to hear us last time, I'll just do a brief, brief overview of my mother's story. My mother was not quite 13 when the Nazis invaded Poland, September 9th, 1939. And she was hurled into the ghetto with her family, with her father, her mother, her sister, and two brothers. She had a baby sister that was born in the ghetto. She had a very, very difficult time, as did everyone in the Lodge ghetto. Cramped conditions, typhus, scarlet fever, starvation, and of course, children were forced to work. And she worked very, very hard she, to get food rations. And my mother is very slight and delicate. She's a very petite woman. And she was having difficulty because she was assigned to the leather factory and her hands bled, but she knew that she wouldn't get her ration if she didn't finish her quota. Her younger brother, my amazing uncle, came to help her after he finished his quota, came to help her so that they could get their food rations. In 1944, on the second to last transport out of the Lodge ghetto, she was forced into a cattle car, with her father had been sent earlier but with her mother and the baby who had been born and her two brothers at the point of Mangala's baton when they arrived in Auschwitz and people were dying of course all around her in the cattle car and there was no air there was no food unbelievable conditions and when she got there her mother said to her and her sister you two stay together I'm going to stay with the baby at the point of Mangala's baton, my mother and her sister went to the right. My grandmother and my mother's younger sister went to the left. That was the last time my mother saw her mother and her baby sister. When my mother's two younger brothers, the youngest was sent straight to the gas chambers and the middle son survived. From Auschwitz, she was there about six weeks from Auschwitz, she was shipped to Stutthof. At Stutthof, the conditions were just as unbearable, if not worse than in Auschwitz, just simply unbearable. And she said everywhere people were scared, lonely, tired, sick, and starving. From Stutthof, she was there approximately six weeks again, and she was forced on a death march. Now, all around her, women were dying. If you couldn't keep up with the march, you were just shot on the spot. And a lot of people couldn't, obviously. A lot of women couldn't. She and her sister could. And they made, they stayed in the march. And fortunately for them, they were taking women and they were pushing them onto boats. At, at pushing them onto boats. They later found out that the boats had holes. And so all the women drowned. But just as it, she was approaching her turn, the Allied forces flew overhead and the guards took cover and my mother and her sister ran and ran and ran. She survived the rest of the war going from farm to farm, working to get food. That's the brief overview, or, or I hope it was brief, of my mother's story. Stutthof was, according to my mother, beyond description. The typhus, as I said earlier, the typhus, scarlet fever, the starvation was unbelievable. Now, my mother didn't have a blanket. She didn't have a bed. She didn't have food. She couldn't use the lavatory when she wanted. This was all pre-described and all set to make life miserable and hellacious. She and her sister were fortunate in that they survived. However, 
when we look to Sylvia, we see that there's a whole different ball game over there. There's a whole different way of looking at this. And I'd like to hear, until I met Sylvia, I didn't know about the status of her grandfather at, at Stuthof. And I really would like to know about that. And then perhaps the two of us can compare the differences, compare and contrast, if you will. So then Sylvia, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and your grandfather? All right, thanks, Marilyn. Thanks so much for sharing the story about your mother. It just sounds heartbreaking. Uh, and I can only imagine what it was for her and, and for you to, to hear about all this. Um, I grew up in Chicago and in a very Lithuanian community. And uh, my grandfather was known as a World War II hero in Lithuania for fighting against the communists and for fighting against the Nazis. And um, he has a very complicated story, but part of that story includes spending time in the Stutthof concentration camp. And so I was always told how he was an anti-Nazi and that the Nazis brought him to the Stutthof concentration camp. And I was led to believe, as I think many Lithuanians were, that he had the typical experience that your mother had, Marilyn. And uh, when I did my research on my grandfather, I was a little shocked to find out that it was a completely different experience. Um, the reason he was brought to the Stutthof concentration camp is because the country of Lithuania um, in 1943, it was right after the Battle of Stalingrad, right when the Nazis were finally losing World War II and the Allies were, fi you know, uh, were finally winning, this is the point where the Lithuanians became quite brave in standing up to the Nazis. And the Nazis asked the Lithuanians to join the SS. And the Lithuanians, to their credit, said no way. And um, that was the reason the Nazis then sent my grandfather and 45 other men from Lithuania as hostages to the Stutthof concentration camp. So. In my research, um, obviously my grandfather died 14 years before I was born. So I did most of my research through uh, three memoirs that were written by other uh, men who were in the Stutthof concentration camp. And my grandfather wrote 77 letters to my grandmother. Uh, and those 77 letters were, were a major treasured item in our family. So that's how I put his story together, what happened to him in Stutthof. Plus, I took a tour of Stutthof in 2013 and talked to the, uh, the museum director and read a couple more books on Stutthof. So um, he didn't arrive to Stutthof in a cattle car. When the SS or the, uh, the, the Nazis that um, came to his home in Chole, he had been head of the Chole district. Uh, for about two years during the Nazi occupation. And um, they gave him an hour to pack up his things. And then they brought him to um, like this culture and work center in Kaunas where they were gathering all these 46 men as kind of the central point, the central headquarters. And they were nervous, they were scared, but they were treated quite well. They got uh, eggs, bacon, cigarettes, um, and they're all trying to figure out what, what they did wrong and what's happening to them. They were afraid of getting executed right on the spot. So, so there was the fear factor. Um, from there, they were taken on a bus to um, Stutthof. And uh, they had uh, little sandwiches wrapped in wax on the way there. So it was not the cattle car situation. Um, so when they got there, that's when life really did become bad. When they got there, this is the point where for about six weeks, they did have the experience your mother had, Marilyn. Uh, so for six weeks, they were beaten, they were uh, made fun of, they were tortured, they had to do those roll calls, they, they were starved, they also experienced the typhus and the scarlet fever and all the diseases. Um, but, but by the end of six weeks, something very, very unusual happened to them. By that point, nine of them died from disease. So that left uh, 37. So 37 of them were alive. 
And um, Heinrich Himmler, who is designed these concentration camps as death camps, all you know, gave uh, a brand new designation to these uh, remaining Lithuanians, and they, he called them honorary prisoners. And it's funny because when I grew up, my grandmother would tell me, you know what, your grandfather, he was an honorary prisoner in the Stutthof concentration camp. And I thought, oh, wow, what an honor. My grandfather was, you know, an honorary prisoner. And I thought that uh, until I started doing research on this and I'm, and I'm reading this, uh, what this meant to be an honorary prisoner. And, you know, today in 2021 to get an honor from Heinrich Himmler is not much of an honor. And so I, I'm trying to figure out what they did to deserve this honor. But their lives changed dramatically. Most of the barracks had like 500 people stuffed in them. And as you said, no beds. All of a sudden, these remaining 37 guys got their own barracks. It was a, a rather uh, remodeled. It used to be a sewing center. And now they like they reconverted into this barracks just for these Lithuanian men. Um, they got their own beds. They got sheets, they got pillows, they got pillowcases, and they got three blankets each. Um, food rations were still bad, so they were still hungry. Um, they didn't have to work, though. They did not have to work. They could choose to work if they decided to work. And many of them just chose to work because it's pretty boring just sitting around in your bed all day uh so they so they they took some assignments my grandfather with this um professor Yurgutis, who was a, about six years old at that time they were kind of in this construction bureau and so they they worked sort of in an office uh in this construction bureau others like kind of were able to work in the library others maybe were working in the tailor one of them was a doctor and and he got to uh provide health care for these 37 men. Uh, so he got to take care of them. Um, so it was, uh, they had originally red triangles because they were political prisoners. They got to take those triangles off. They got new clothes. Um, and they also got to wear their own jackets. And then on top of the jackets, they had to wear a yellow armband to show that they were prisoners. So um, completely their own schedule. They, they, and, you know, when I was doing my research and I'm really digging into the story, I'm kind of looking over these 77 letters that my uh, grandfather got, uh, wrote to my grandmother. And I'm thinking, you know, I never remember any, uh, you know, any of these, uh, you know, Jews who were in a concentration camp being able to send letters home. So when I was really thinking about that, I was like, this is odd that I even have these 77 letters written from a concentration camp. Um, those letters now are at the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Um, so it's, it's uh, very, uh, this honorary prisoner designation was given to very, very few prisoners. And I still don't know why they were given this designation. Um, he Heinrich Himmler gave it to some Norwegian statesmen, no Latvian statesmen and Norwegian policemen, and then these Lithuanian and then these Lithuanian uh, hostages. So very rare designation, and they called them. You know, they were known as the aristocrats of uh, the Stutthof concentration camp because their lives were so, so different. Um, so that is the story. Oh, then, and then the evacuation, um, also not really a death march. They were, the, they were allowed to leave first in the first wave. They were allowed to build sleds before they left and pack up uh, all of their items and they were um, essentially, I mean, it was difficult. There was a lot of snow. I'm not saying it was an easy walk, but, you know, by our American standards, uh, it would not be easy. But they were be, uh, escorted to the train station. And then they were allowed to, you know, uh, climb into the, tra into the train cars and go on their way. 
And from there, a lot of these guys escaped to the West. Mm -hmm. They find they ended up uh, going back up to the West. My grandfather um, was taking care of this Professor Yurgutis who got very sick. He got like pneumonia, we think, or uh, something like that. And he stayed to care for him. Uh, I think it was the town of Lodz in Poland, uh, which was nearby. And he was there for like 40 days, you know, taking care of this Professor Yurgutis. And then he got sick himself while he was taking care of him. And then Professor Yurgutis had to take care of him. Uh, so this is part of the story. And then he got, and then um, I guess at this point, the Russians arrived and my grandfather got conscripted into the Russian army briefly. And then from there, they released him. And uh, in November, 1945, he arrived in Vilnius and um, hooked up with Professor Yurgutis, uh, who, who was not taken by the Russians because he was 50 years old and he was old for the military. But um, he stayed with Professor Yurgutis and his daughter for for a while. And then that was the moment. That was the point. And then he connected with any with a lot of other guys from the Spitfire concentration camp that uh, came back to Vilnius. And and he he tried to mastermind this overthrow of the Soviet Union at that point. After which he landed in the KGB prison, and then um, he died at the age of thirty six. So that's my grandfather's story, Marilyn, which yeah. I know dramatically different from my mother's story. You know, I hear it and I know it because we've talked many times that I've read your book. However, sometimes it's still painful to hear that he was even a prisoner. When I think of my mother in uh, this delicate little woman, they gave her a huge dress just to, you know, make it even more humiliating for her and so hungry and starving and in the cattle car and then walking in the snow. My aunt had no shoes, later developed gangrene, had to have her toes removed from one foot. When I hear all of that, it's the contrast is just amazing. And it's hard for me to fathom, frankly, how he was made into a hero. I, I understand how it happened, but it's incredibly difficult to comprehend. I know what the story is, but when people deny the Holocaust, it becomes even more difficult. And I think about my mother and she was 18. You know, she, she was a kid, you know, and, and it's hard for me to imagine that your grandfather lived this different life at the same time. They were there at the same time. You know, it's so difficult. And then he's made into a hero and they hold up that he was a, a, a prisoner at Stutthof. A prisoner at Stutthof was my mother and my aunt. Those were prisoners to me. And I really, as I said earlier, I didn't even know about this honorary status. I had never heard about it. And I find it remarkable. What stands out for you when we talk about the contrast? Um, For me, it was just... Um... You know, I'm not saying it was even under these conditions, it was probably difficult to be in the Stutthof concentration camp. Uh, but to me, what stands out is that I grew up my entire life hearing how he was in a concentration camp. And even now that my book is out, I hear from Lithuanians, but your grandfather was in a concentration camp. That proves he's an anti-Nazi. And, and this is a really big defense yeah. that all, you know, many Lithuanians have been using to sort of show that, hey, he is a hero. Hey, he did suffer. And um, I am incensed that they're using the Holocaust story that Jews experienced in a concentration camp and overlaying that onto my grandfather's experience and the other guys there. Right. As, as an excuse so that they could kind of, or so that my grandfather, you know, could get away with uh, what he did during the Nazi yes. occupation. Yes. Right. There, there were other guys too who were sure. involved. Sure. Sure. Uh, not all not all of the 46 were like my, my grandfather. There, there were a couple priests and and so forth, but, but all of them were able to um, share in, in this honorary prisoner kind of just by virtue of association. 
of right. being with these guys. And, and then what when I, he had paper to write letters. He wrote 77 letters to your grandmother. When I think about that paper and writing, that was so far from my mother's consciousness, just trying to survive and to stay with her sister hand in hand. That was her entire consciousness. I, we have to live through this. We have to live through this paper. And, you know, you mentioned eggs, that he had eggs on the way there and little sandwiches. My mother spent the four years in the Lodge ghetto. Her baby sister was born in the ghetto and she spent hours, my mom said, telling her what an egg tasted like, what chocolate tasted like, and what a flower looked like. Now that little girl was killed before her third birthday. And I've always, never knowing, my mother always says she never knew what it was like not to be hungry, a three-year-old. And when I hear just the word eggs, it triggers so much for me because here was my mother describing eggs, describing chocolate. By the time they had reached Stutthof, I'm confident that my mother thought, well, we'll never see an egg. We'll never see flour. We'll never taste chocolate again. However, what is really remarkable to me is that my mother has emerged from all of this as life affirming. She is the most positive person you can encounter. And I've always found that juxtaposition really incredible that she could be so positive and have her priorities so clear. But just even the word eggs triggered this whole scene for me. I imagined my mother talking to her baby sister. So all of this is so different. And, you know, my friends and colleagues have asked me, well, how do you feel about Sylvia? And I must tell you, uh, you're a hero to me, that you came so clean with this book and showed us what's really happening at great personal peril. You were willing to do it. To me, it's amazing. And, and I wanted you to know that. And I wanted you to know it publicly because our lives are so different and our, our, stories, are different, and our stories are really different. I feel like I don't deserve this honor at all. Uh, I truly don't. Um, I appreciate your saying it though. And it's really kind of you. I just feel, I just feel terrible um, that this is, that this is being used as, as the cover up story for, for what my grandfather did. One of my researchers said that about 12 guys were perpetrators in the Holocaust um, who were taken as these hostages. And one of them um, is probably, you know, the mastermind kind of involved in the whole thing. And he was, it wasn't my grandfather, it was someone who was even older than him, this Mischauskas. And he was the one who really probably dealt with the, the Germans and, Hein, you know, Heinrich Himmler. And um, and just by virtue of association, they, they were all able to, you know, get this designation. I am not a hero by any stretch of the imagination. I and I, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, that was not an easy book to write. And you came very, very clean. And, you, you know, your recall is remarkable. And the research was remarkable. You know, you start thinking about all the differences. You talked about that they chose to maybe do some work. And I'm imagining this library and this office and my mother doing hard labor in a dress that didn't fit with shaved heads. And she was sick and she was starving and she had her older sister, all of 18 months older. She had her older sister, but so scared. And here you're saying, well, they chose to work. And, you know, my mother and sister were beaten and your grandfather didn't have that, didn't have to endure that. It was an entirely different experience and that it's being held up as this is one of the reasons he's a hero is... I don't know if I have the correct word for it. It's appalling. Hypocritical. Yes. Uh, it is appalling. It's distressing too. Yes. Yes. Um, and uh, this information was uh, around for years and years. It's not like I just came up with something new. I mean, I read these memoirs that were written, you know, decades ago. And I, and I kind of pieced it together. So this could have been put together, you know, by other, you know, by real historians. I'm a journalist. <laughs> um, so, but I, but I am a granddaughter and I, and I was worried about the truth. Another thing that they did was they had a little academy in there, in this um, barracks that they were in when they were honorary prisoners. So they could like study 
So oh, like a my. School. oh my, my mom said she, she, she imagined what a book would look like. She missed it so much. And I'm hearing this and it's just the juxtaposition is, is beyond anything we can really comprehend and fathom. So different. And didn't I read, or perhaps you told me in a previous conversation about that your grandfather was able to receive vitamins. Yeah, because on top of receiving the letters, uh, he could receive one letter a week, a week. Most, you know, most of them were from my grandmother, uh-huh. but some t- some were from other friends. And he could receive a little package, uh-huh. and in this package, they, they could get vitamins, food, vegetables, fruit, uh-huh. chocolate. Right, chocolate. Um, another trigger word for me. I know. See. I know. I can see. Yeah. And uh, money. He had a bank account. They, he oh. had some kind of an account. Oh. Um, and I, and one of the letters that he wrote to my grandmother, he said, don't worry about money. I've got plenty of money here. Unbelievable. So yes. so he, he was allowed to get money and save it. And I guess he was allowed to take it with him when he left. Right. And this is, um, this is the man that's a hero now. And this is how how history has been distorted, if you will. History has been distorted. And um, they... You know, they took advantage of the Jewish version uh, of what happened in a concentration camp and just, you know, conveniently allowed people to assume because that's all most people know about the concentration camp. Right. Nobody right. knows about honorary prisoner. I certainly didn't. Yes. Yes. And it. what's amazing is that he had a, a very soft life, given that he was in Stutthof. He and his his colleagues, his the forty five men, and then it was thirty seven, right? Right. The thirty seven. Yeah. The first six weeks were really, really bad. Yes, that's what you said. Yes. But after that, you know, uh, the next, you know, fifteen months uh, were uh, somebody referred to it, to it as like a little camp oh, atmosphere. Dear. You know, yes. like like it was like camp. They were right. hungry. They, they, they were hungry, but they still, you know, like I said, with those packages, that yes. really helped them. And they were they, yeah. they could even get uh, bacon was a big thing. You oh, know, my. Yes. That right. They could get sent through the mail. Uh, the that, other thing, Marilyn. Yes. Is uh, and I was appalled, you know, uh, this is, you know, hashtag me too, a sort of thing. Um, they were allowed to visit women. Oh, in another oh. barracks. Oh, 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 unsolicited from the women. Well, this, this is where this is where you signed, kind of enlightened me. And, uh-huh. and you tell me what you said. We repeat. Do you remember what you said to me the first time we talked about it? About the men raping the women? Yeah, about the men rape because I didn't consider it as rape yet. I just thought, oh, right. you know, they met a woman in another barracks. No, and they no, had a no, little no, romance. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. They were raping women. And these women, we have to remember these Jewish women were starving and they were sick and they were scared. What were they going to do? Fight them off? You know, and the, and the idea, they said at one point that only only the single men did it. Well, that doesn't make it any better. Rape is rape. Right. And, you, and you've got women who are starving and scared. That's all they needed to add to, to this this horrible, horrible life. You know, it's a life that most people don't understand. And when we think about it, when we think about, you know, he was married, your grandfather. So maybe he decided he didn't want to do it. And he wrote love letters. But still think about it. He was writing love letters. And my mother and her aunt were just praying for survival. You know, I mean, that's quite a juxtaposition. And that's quite different. It is. It is. How has it been, Marilyn, for you to grow up, um, you know, as a child of a Holocaust survivor? I, I imagine that, you know, it's not something you could ever forget. Well, it's with me all the time. I said on a previous broadcast that it it shadows my every move, you know, and it influences every decision I make. Now, my parents, fortunately were very life affirming. As I said, my mother was life affirming. My father was extremely optimistic in his own way also. And he's unfortunately no longer with us, but they talked about it all the time. They talked to us when we were young. And I think that made it easier. Now, my grandmother, my father's mother, 
my paternal grandmother survived also. They were from Lodz, Poland, and she survived and lived with us. I shared a room with my grandmother for the first 12 years of my life. Wow. So, so I heard a lot, uh, and she lost seven children and nine grandchildren to the Holocaust. Oh, my gosh. And she was life-affirming. You know, I look back and I thought, how could she be so positive? What do you and, think made them so life affirming? What was in them? How, what do you think? Because so many, so many people would be depressed. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not sure, but they really, really wanted to create new lives. And they did. And they did. And my mother was very active in speaking at school. She spoke to the California legislator on the importance of Holocaust education. I mean, my mother's whole thing, thing is a bad word. My mother's whole approach was let's educate people so this doesn't happen again. And when she met my father, he said to her very calmly, write it down, write it down because they will say it didn't happen. They will claim it didn't happen. And he was right. He was right. People have claimed it didn't happen. You know, just recently we had the case of the Lithuanian Baltusits. I'm not yes. pronouncing right. Who was a guard at Majdanek, the concentration camp Majdanek. My father-in-law was in Majdanek. Oh. Yes, my father-in-law was born and raised in Lublin and was in Majdanek. And they said that Baltusitz, well, he was outside. The genocide center in Lithuania said he was outside. You know, he was the, the head of the guards outside the camp. So he didn't really know what was going on. When you're the daughter of survivors, that's absolutely too much to hear. How is that possible that he didn't know what was going on? The people in the city of Lublin were complaining about the stench from the burning bodies. They weren't complaining that thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews were being murdered. They were complaining about the stench. And you're going to tell me that he didn't know what was going on? And that's the official word from the genocide center in Lithuania. How does that make you feel when you hear that? This is where I just uh, feel horrible. Uh, you know, I used to be such a proud Lithuanian. I grew up, you know, I was raised with the idea that when Lithuania becomes free, I need, I need to do everything I can to help Lithuania get back on its feet. And um, when Lithuania does something like this, I, 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 I feel kind of sick to my stomach. I'm disgusted. Uh, I feel ashamed. They, I think because they were under the Soviet Union for so long, they just don't know how to come clean. I think because I'm an American, like, you know, we were more, we were more, I mean, not that America's perfect either. Yeah. You know, all kinds of things are still hidden in this country, like the genocide of the Indians and, you know, what the, yes. what the blacks went through and everything. It's still not, you know, enough in people's consciousness, but, um, Lithuania lost, killed, murdered 96.4% of the Jews. Yes. And they played such a big role in doing this. And they just keep, they keep coming up with one excuse after another, how it wasn't their fault. And how yes. they had no idea what they were doing. Today in the Washington Post, did you see that story yeah. about yeah. The, the woman who ran away from the trial? And she was in Shtipov. Yes. Yeah, she was in Shtipov. She was 96 years old. And she ran away so she wouldn't have to be tried. They took her from her healthcare facility. And she said she just didn't want to tell the truth. She didn't want to. And be she was a secretary it. who wrote the, who I guess transcribed or typed yes. out the, the execution order. Yes. And she's considered guilty just for being a secretary typing out the order. But she's and in Germany. Germany. What? But she's in, but she's in Germany. And Germany has approached it differently. I know, but in Lithuania, my every the excuse yeah. for my grandfather is when he wrote when he wrote those orders, he didn't know what he was writing either. But oh, he was please. the governor of Lithuania. He wasn't like this little secretary. Yeah. Right, right. She knew everything that was going on. Everyone saying that they didn't know is is beyond ludicrous, you know, as Deborah Lipstadt would say, beyond belief. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yes. And it's very hard as the daughter of survivors, the daughter in law of survivors, to hear it. You know, my Donick was a horrible, horrible place. And if they can, perhaps everyone doesn't know that there's schools, there's a school named after your grandfather. There's a right. street named after Baltusis, who, Baltusis, forgive me, who, Baltusis, Baltusis, yeah. who was head of the guards. 
at, at my Donick. And I think, how can that be? How can that be? My American consciousness says, how can that be that that's happening? You know, that there's street, there's parks named after people. People who were responsible for murdering thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews. And we have streets named after them. We have parks named after them. We have schools named after them. Indeed, wasn't it the school where you first learned about your grandfather, where that first piqued your interest? Yeah, I was in the school uh, named after my grandfather just months after the death of my mother and my grandmother when I first started, you know, when I first received this assignment, if you will, to write the story about my grandfather. So the irony of hearing that he first killed Jews, that the first time I heard it, that he killed Jews was in the school named after him, like perhaps the largest monument in his honor in the school. I'm a teacher now too. So I really, you know, think schools are so important in educating our children. And to have a school named after you know, I used to be so proud of, about this, too, that my grandfather had a school named after him. I would tell people all the time, now I'm ashamed that this is happening. And I couldn't even imagine children graduating from the school and hearing the story about, you know, his role in the Holocaust. And if this and if that isn't bad enough, it's it's the government denying everything. And yes, so many yes. Lithuanians denying. I have so much hate mail, so much hate from Lithuanians, so mm -hmm. upset that I outed my grandfather on this. And yes. I just, I just cannot believe how, how angry they are, how angry they are. Because in their mind, he only killed Jews, so it doesn't matter, you know. Yeah, it's either that or they just cannot believe. He, they like are in total denial that he did that anything he did. to kill Jews. But there's, but there's documentation. We have his signature, your grandfather's signature. We have other people's signature, and there's schools, parks, everything's named after them. How can that be? How can we? rationalize that how can we make that right that's not right and yet the genocide center in lithuania gives us these excuses time after time after time and to like twist the knife in further now there's people in lithuania saying that he played a big role in saving jews no while he was the governor i just saw a video like two days ago about this and they're they're going there's a priest on this video there's just all kinds of experts on this video talking about how my grandfather was involved in saving Jews. And really, here's the, here's the bottom line. I think some of his friends did, did save a few Jews and, okay. and they let my grandfather know. And my grandfather said, okay, save your Jews. Right. In the meantime, Right. What was he doing? Signing orders. Signing to orders to kill thousands and thousands. I think like that, that that saving Jew escapade, maybe they saved like 10, 15 Jews between yes. like the five men there. And my grandfather yeah. sort of passively was in there and said, OK, save deal. them. And that this for them is saving Jews. Right. right. Even though he was very passive about it. Mm -hmm. And when he's actively signing these orders. Right. To kill them. To kill them. The they have no, the they excuse baby. that. They excuse right. that. Right, right. It's frightening. It's frightening. It's scary. It's appalling. I'm not sure I have enough adjectives. It was, <laughs> it's so awful. It's it's beyond awful. And no matter what we try and we say, this is happening, this is happening. And you're showing proof. You've got documents and they still have created a narrative that's false. That's No matter what proof, what proof I show, what, whatever's in my book, they don't like this. They say this. They don't like this. They say this. Like they find something wrong everywhere. Yes. Everywhere. Yes. If, when you're yes. in denial, every nothing, nothing is acceptable. Yes. Yes. And if you've created a narrative about people being heroes and, and feeling proud because they fought the Soviets, then how do you reconcile the truth? How do you say, well, well, maybe this isn't the truth and they're not prepared to do it. It's, hard, to it's, too hard. it's too hard. How long will it take for them? do you think to recognize the truth and to teach the children you're a teacher? Well, Marilyn, it took, you know, just on a very personal level, it took me 10 years to get over the denial, but I was working at this almost every day, kind of looking into the story of my grandfather and I was, I was working at it. And it, and even with all that, it took me about 10 years to finally say, even now, I, even me, the granddaughter, now can accept that my grandfather was involved in killing mm -hmm. Jews. 
Right. But that took me 10 years to get from. Sure, sure. From, from here, you to know, here. believing that he was a hero. So that, so I don't know how long it'll take Lithuania. You know, most people are not looking into the story the way I did. Right, right. And don't know about the monuments and ever, how these men were being heralded as, as heroes, of national heroes for Lithuania. You know, it's right. a very difficult thing for the child of survivors to hear and for the daughter-in-law of survivors to hear. I'm so sorry, Marilyn. I wish I wish I had a magic wand to change it. Thank you. Thank you. But you know what? You're not you're not culpable. This is not you. You didn't do this. It's I still just, feel guilty. And now, now I'm going to be like, you know, you're one of your patients. I still no. feel guilty. <laughs> no, no, no. You didn't do this. You should feel proud because you're setting the narrative straight and you're telling people the truth. My mother is fond of telling this story that her brother that survived Auschwitz was in Auschwitz and saw his father and he ran to him. But he wasn't sure it was his father because my grandfather had lost so much weight and looked so much different. He'd been beaten in the ghetto. He'd been beaten and he'd been beaten severely in Auschwitz. And my uncle said to him, stay here. Come back tomorrow. I'll steal some bread. I will bring you my bread. And my grandfather said, OK, I'll meet you here tomorrow. My grandfather didn't show up. And we have speculated over the years his daughters, and our entire family. He didn't want to take the bread from his son. That's why he didn't show up, you know? And we don't know the exact day he was murdered, but our family firmly believes that he just felt like he couldn't take it from his from his son, you know? And I think about food rations and what food means and, and how people respond to it. To this day, my mother's a chocoholic. I mean, the woman has never said no to a piece of chocolate. <laughs> and and, and well, God you know, bless her. She's yeah. earned it. <laughs> yes. And and when she, and I know that she's thinking about her little sister that was killed. Or when we go to a restaurant and sit down, my mother will always say, My two sons are very proud of her and they love hearing her say, because she'll say when inevitably when we sit down to a restaurant or to dinner together, she'll say, do you know what it means to be hungry and to be able to eat? You know, this is a woman who's lived through it all and life emerging and successful in her life. A great marriage, loves her kids, loves her grandchildren, you know, just a great mother, grandmother, and, you know, happily married for 68 years. How is she today? What's going on with her? She's okay. She's okay. You know, she's older and tired. But How old is she today? It depends who you ask. Oh. <laughs> We're going to stay officially 96, but then not everybody in the family agrees with that. There's a year difference one way or the other. But the idea that she could still be life affirming is yeah. what makes me so proud. Yeah. And my father-in-law and mother-in-law are the same way. My father-in-law, as I said earlier, is no longer with us. But my mother-in-law does not complain. Does not complain. And you think, how can you be in your 90s and not have aches and pains and things? That, she doesn't complain. And it's remarkable to, to love life so much and to just seize what you have and make it work. You know, my mother has always been grateful for everything that's come her way. Everything. If you say something to her, she goes, oh, no, I don't need that. Look at what I've got. And that's a remarkable thing. But when you come from nothing and when you come from hell, it's a lot. And, you know, she lost her parents young and a brother and a sister and both sets of grandparents and her aunts and her uncles and her cousins. And she can still be life affirming. She can still believe in humankind. That's hard. That's beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. I'm glad that I'm glad that uh, attitude in life is everything. Yes. You know, in contrast, my grandmother was very pes pessimistic. Everything oh. was wrong. Everything was always wrong. Oh, dear. Uh, very critical woman. My mom had a hard time. You know, they loved each other, but my right. mom had a hard time with her. Um, so it's interesting that on the other, yes. you know. But I'm wondering uh, if your grandmother wasn't harboring a secret. Because she, she told me not to was. Was. Right. Oh, so, so if you harbor a secret, you become like that? You can. Psychologically? You can. You know, secrets can destroy you. Secrets can kill you. 
And I think that your grandmother, I'm speculating, I think that your grandmother had that secret. And all around her, people were, were praising her for who she had been married to. Right. You know, and there's medals in her house and pictures of him and in your home growing up. So think about it. Every time she looked at it, she knew what was really happening. She may have agreed that it was okay, and she probably rationalized it to herself. But she did tell you, to leave it, leave it alone. Don't write the book. And then, uh, and then her last words on her deathbed, I can never remember them. I, I can never forget them. You know, she first of all, she said it's life. What it wasn't worth it. Mm. And I'm like, what wasn't worth it? Uh-huh. And she wouldn't answer. Uh huh. And then uh, a Eucharistic minister, you know, we're Catholic, came into the Holy Cross Hospital to give her communion, and she refused it. Ah. And, and this is, and and I always, you know, and I'm sitting there and I'm like, Mochucha, don't you believe in God? Like, you know, and I'm thinking I'm worried about her afterlife and everything already. Right. And uh, and then she says, and then she said, this is this really and i still didn't know what was going on right christ was just a clever jew who who tricked the whole world oh my oh my christus buvolo bai gudrujidas kuris apgavo visa pasaulė that's what she said in lithuania and that'll stay with you forever i'll never forget it yeah that will stay with you forever that will stay with you forever and fortunately, you don't have what I have. And I have selective memory. I have mentioned this before numerous times that I have asked my mother, my father, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, many times the same exact question because the answer is too painful for me. You know, and I went to my Donick and all I could see was my father-in-law there. That's all I, in my head, I just kept seeing him with me there. And when I went to Auschwitz, I was with my mother. So it it made it easier because we were together. But I kept thinking when I was in my Donick, oh no, he had to go through this. Oh no, oh no, oh no, every moment. And all four of them have been incredibly patient with me for forgetting, understanding that I had to forget because the answer is too painful. It's simply too painful. It's It's too much to carry all the time. So I ask again and again and again. You don't have that, that selective memory. No, no. I think a lot of other Lithuanians do though. But not because it was pain, uh, because it wasn't the truth. Not because it wasn't the truth. Right. And today's generation of Lithuanian, they don't, I, I most really don't know. They're like me. I grew up completely ignorant of this. Most just don't know. Mm-hmm. We we were fed a big pack of lies about this. Still being fed. And still being yes. fed. Yes. So that is the hard part because we're trying right. to change that narrative. We're trying to change so people know the truth. Because you can't move on until the truth comes out. And that's why. I know. It's this has been very cathartic for me. I mean, as painful as, as it's all been, I I feel a sense of relief in just being able to talk about it. I'm I'm happy that that's happening. I I know that you and I can continue this, and we will, you know, a million times over. But I want to thank Dylan and I can for, for for inviting me. I, I'm really honored by that, and thank you for being so honest and for the book. Thank you, and I wish I could give you a big hug, Marilyn. It's a virtual <laughs> hug. It's a virtual hug. I love you. Love you too. Take care. Do we have Dylan somewhere to close us out. I, I am here. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you both. That was an extraordinary, extraordinary conversation. Um, and thank you both for, for being willing to come back and, and have this uh, continuing intimate conversation. Um, for those of you watching, I, I hope you um, were as compelled as I was uh, with this um, with this interchange. And uh, Marilyn and uh, Sylvia, we thank you again. And um, again, we, we hope to have you back and maybe we can explore this even more. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you both.